It's time to leave the United Nations. That is the topic of tonight's byline. It would be easy to dismiss the latest attempt by the United Nations to meddle in Canadian affairs. The Sun Media National Editorial today rightly refers to the upcoming visit by James Enea, the UN Special Rapporteur on Indigenous Peoples, as UN Tourism. Uh, that's an accurate phrase, and as the editorial points out, Enea's nine-day trip across the country in the ensuing report will not solve a problem that has gripped politicians, activists, academics, and native leaders for decades, if not much longer than that. In fact, it will likely make things worse. Enea will, well, it looks as if he will follow the pattern set out by other special rapporteurs of the UN. He'll visit a country, speak to left-wing activists pushing for radical change. Then he will write a report that echoes what they told him so that those same activists can wave around the report in front of the media saying, we've got to act, we must act. The UN demands it. That's what happens with Scooter, Olivier de Scooter, when he came to talk about food security. Another special rapporteur, Richard Falk, well... He's so much of a one-sided activist on the Israeli-Palestinian issue that he's charged with examining that he's been denounced by governments around the world and even by UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Anea comes from a similar activist background. What does that mean for Canada? Well, it looks like there'll be more calls for Canada to bring our law in line with international law and United Nations declarations and frameworks. I warn about these UN documents and agreements at every turn. I point out that the UN is attempting to set up a binding set of laws that go above and beyond national laws passed by elected governments. That idea is scoffed at, but I guarantee you that that will be the focus of Anaya's report, that Canada must bring its laws, policies, and actions in line with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. That's what he did in his report last year in the United States. Quote, the declaration, which is grounded in widespread consensus and fundamental human rights values, should be a benchmark for all relevant decision making by the federal executive, Congress, and the judiciary, as well as by the states of the United States. So there you have it. The U.S. should follow U.N. dictates, the nebulous world of international law, and forget all about that little pesky constitution they have or their domestic law. This is UN thinking. This is how an organization that essentially sees itself as the global government operates. Later in his report, Anaya does mention that the UN Declaration on Indigenous Peoples, well, it's not legally binding, but then he goes on at length on all the things the US must do given their acceptance of the treaty. It's going to be the same thing for Canada. We will be chastised for past wrongs and encouraged to offer reparations for events that happened long ago. I don't know about you, but I don't believe in reparations, paying people off by, well, they're paid by people alive today for wrongs committed by those long dead. Are we to pay First Nations for things that happened that far past? Where would that stop? Could the Huron people that once populated much of Southern Ontario and Quebec that, well, they were nearly wiped out by the Iroquois, could they then seek reparations from their fellow Aboriginals? I don't deny that bad things happen in Canadian history, but Look at world history, go around the world and you just look at, you see how peoples of all cultures have treated each other. It's almost always badly. It was the same in Canada before European settlers came. Dredging up past wrongs won't fix present day problems. The Harper government gets no credit on this file, but they've actually settled more land claims than any other government in decades. They, they did, the, perhaps ever actually, they did the residential schools apology. They've also expanded real human rights to people living on reserves. In fact, in a bill just passed in June, women living on reserve were given rights to the matrimonial home in the event of death or marriage breakup. This didn't happen before. Women got nothing. But native activists, they opposed this bill. Pam Palmader, a key figure in the Idle No More movement and someone likely to be consulted by Professor Anea when he comes, well, she denounced this bill, saying it was all about individual rights that were protected by the bill, and she wanted collective rights, which sounds like a Marxist, which Palmader is, but it also sounds like what Anea proposes elsewhere. In fact, the document that Anea pushes most, the UN Declaration on Indigenous Peoples, well, it speaks often of collectivism. This visit, like others by UN special rapporteurs, it's not about human rights, nor is it about the rights of indigenous peoples. It's about a political agenda. Canadians need to go into this with eyes wide open. And that's the byline. 
James Anaya, the special rapporteur, has said the federal government has ignored his request to visit Canada in order to investigate the human rights situation of the indigenous people. Anaya has written to the federal government at least three times since February last year, requesting permission to visit the country. That was a report from Press TV. Not sure who is behind Press TV. Uh, he used to be a guy named Ahmadinejad. It's the Iranian government mouth organ criticizing Canada for not allowing An Anaya in earlier on. I wonder what they'll say after this report. Joining me now for further discussion at this is a man that has uh, seen the UN at work, seen the good, seen the bad, and uh, has a good column this weekend on it. Uh, Simon Kent joins me now. Uh, Simon, uh, your column looked not just at James Anaya, but also at others that are visiting and the fact that you know, the UN is heaping praise on Zimbabwe. Well, the same time as we're getting visitors here in Canada from the UN, uh, they're being welcomed. Uh, the UN representatives are being welcomed in Zimbabwe, where you, you probably recall they had an election just recently. And I think Uncle Bob Mugabe, Comrade Bob, got close to 80% of the vote in that poor, benighted country. And the UN sat back and, and smiled and beamed at, at, at good old Zimbabwe, even though the people starve and people die, and it's got one of the highest rates of AIDS infection in the world. And there's something like 95 or 97% unemployment, and the country clearly cannot feed itself. Yet the UN beams, and at the same time will turn around and start tutting and waving its finger at Canada. It, it's almost a joke. But it shouldn't be a joke because this sort of splendid idiocy costs a huge amount of money. It costs tens of millions of dollars a year to fund the UN, to, to, to go to their talk shops and to, to go around the world telling other countries how to live and, and, and how to carry on with their lives. And I think Canada really should be the last stop on any global piece of UN uh, tourism. But, but, you know, Anaya has gone to your native Australia. He's mm -hmm. gone to the US. He, he's gone to uh, New Zealand. He, he goes around the world. He has stopped in some, some other countries with what, to uh, refuel? less stellar rights, like Colombia. Yeah, yeah as his plane refuel. refuels and then he takes off again. I but mean, but we get all of this, and, yeah. and Zimbabwe gets uh, the World Tourism Organization setting up shop. And you know what else they got? Because the country is essentially broke, they couldn't fund their recent election. So the UN gave them 100 two million dollars to fund that election that was 102 billion dollars don't forget the un cannot generate money it doesn't make money it lives on the contributions from member states like canada we're, we're one of the biggest contributors one of the top 10 and always has been since the un was established so this is uh, taxpayers money going from uh, sorry I shouldn't be laughing but Canadian taxpayers money going to an organization that on the one hand will spray it towards Zimbabwe for a totally uh, joke of an election and then turn around and send the same people here who are providing the money to wag its finger at Canadians and Canada isn't perfect there is no country in the world that is perfect but I think Canada is a lot close to reconciling problems of the past with its indigenous peoples than a lot of countries will ever acknowledge, let alone get close to. This should be the last country on any UN tour like this. And it really speaks less of the, the UN than it does of Canada that it's happening. It shouldn't happen at all. I, I want to read to you one of the quotes from uh, mm. Anaya uh, talking about what he's looking for. He says, full respect for treaties, agreements and other constructive arrangements is a crucial element in advancing towards reconciliation with indigenous peoples. In no instance should new treaties or agreements fall below or undermine the standards set forth in the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples or established in other international sources. That last part worries me because that again is saying the UN sets the law. What you agree to with other people is of no matter. We will set the law through the UN. Uh, there, you said that they don't have money except what they get from uh, member nations, and that's, you know, very true. But they also have no authority. They have no authority because they're not elected. I mean, they, they, we can uh, laugh at them funding a joke election in, in Zimbabwe, but there's no democracy at the UN. There's no democracy. They don't answer to, to anyone. And I think Canada would be very wise to let these people in and let them go home and mail the report in. But really, that's all. They're not accountable to anyone. And I think any government in Canada, it's first and foremost, it is accountable to the voters in this country. Uh, and Canada is a sovereign state. It makes its own laws. It makes its own rules. It governs itself. And civil society is framed by the people who live within Canada, not by people living, uh, sorry, working for the UN. And the UN can say whatever it likes. And it's very grandiloquent in the way it talks and, and makes um, grand proposals and grand gestures for countries but Canada it's, it's a joke Canada will make its own laws and it will gazette its own laws and it will 
define its own future. It certainly won't be done by the UN, as you quite rightly point out. They're answerable to no one, um, and it's a pretty they, grand they, lifestyle they, they, they should, have. They, it is. They should get back to trying to keep the peace, which they do badly at, and uh, trying to feed the starving, which they sometimes do well and sometimes not so well. Simon, great okay. talking to you as always. Pleasure. Thank you. Yeah.